Hi everybody, today I'm going to be going over a game between Vera Menchik and Sonia Graf Stevenson. These two women were iconic, iconic trailblazers for women in chess back in the 1920s through like the 40s, early 40s. And they were fucking amazing. I was super inspired to make this video based off of what I read from Chess Queens by Jennifer Shahade. An amazing book. If you have not read it, get on it. I literally read it three times last year because I was obsessed. It was incredibly inspiring and it goes through um, the lives of women in chess throughout the years, people who trailblazed the way back in the 1900s and then through all the way up until today's date. It also goes through Jen's story and her incredibly inspiring life. And I had no idea um, about these players. I really don't know a lot about chess history. I've only been playing the game for two years. So unless I've seen it online, I probably don't know about it. So reading this book and reading about all of these inspiring women, I was like, okay, I got to make a video about this and I need to go through this game because I think that they deserve it. And there's not enough attention that goes to them, honestly. And they were fucking iconic. This was the first head-to-head -head matchup for the Women's Chess Championship. Before this, I think for about 10 years, it had just been like tournament style with Swiss or round robins, but this was the first actual head-to-head -head that we ever saw. And it was basically organized by the two players. Vera at this point already had like six titles. She was already established as the number one chess player for women in all of the world. Sonia at the time was regarded as in the top elite female chess players in the world. Fide didn't organize this tournament, the two players did, but it was recognized by Fide. I just wanted to kind of highlight a little bit about the Women's Chess Championship prior to this from 1927 up until 1937, which is where this uh, match is currently at. So 1927, Vera Menchik, kills it and she wins by uh, a point and a half go to 1930 she wins by a point 1931 she wins by four points you get to 1933 and she wins by five points and then i believe in 1934 or 35 um, Sonia and Vera have their own matchup. It wasn't officially recognized by FIDE as a world championship. It just was like an exhibition kind of, but Vera won regardless. It was four rounds. Uh, Sonia won the first round and then Vera won the last three, making her the winner. So it wasn't really like the title was up for contention, but it still is nice history to know about the two players and how many times they had played in the past against each other. Now we get to 1935 and Vera wins the championship again by three and a half points, just sweeping the entire entire field and it is clear that she is the strongest female chess player in the world at this point. And now you can take us to the present 1937 we're in Semmering Austria and it is a head-to-head -head match between these two very very fierce competitors. Something that was interesting about this match was Vera was kind of known for her positional play and Sonia was known for her attacking style. So you're taking two different chess styles and going up against each other and seeing who's going to win. All right let's get into the game. Vera has the white pieces, Sonia has the black pieces. Vera starts off c4. Sonia responds e6. Vera continues with knight c3 and then we get d5 and then we get d4, the queen's gambit. And so Sonia can decide to go into a queen's gambit accepted or a queen's gambit declined. So she plays knight f6, the queen's gambit declined, and then Vera responds with knight f3. Sonia then responds knight bd7, Vera responds e3, she then responds c6, Vera responds bishop d3, just developing her pieces. And then Sonia responds doing the same thing. She plays bishop e7, they both castle, and then we get to this position where Vera strikes in the center with e4. So now Sonia has the option, she can either play takes here or takes here, but the more common route is gonna be to take um, towards the center, taking that pawn. Vera responds taking with the knight. We get a trade of knights. Bishop takes, and then the knight goes to f6, attacking the bishop. So now is kind of the response of where does she want to put that bishop? Vera decides to put the bishop on c2 and have it aim over at h7. So now Sonia responds with c5, striking the center. And Vera takes the pawn happily, d takes c5. Now Sonia plays queen a5, which is a little bit of a weird move. Um, she is attacking this pawn. But she could have technically um, taken earlier, maybe with the bishop instead, taking bishop c5. But she decides to take playing queen a5. So queen a5, Vera responds, bishop e3. Sonia says, hey, I'll take that pawn. 
And Vera has the option of trading bishops, but she doesn't really want to trade bishops. She has a really nice bishop pair that has a really strong hold potentially to go look at the king side. So she plays bishop d2 with tempo attacking the queen. The queen moves to c7, and this is where you can kind of see that the queen a5 move was kind of weird because she's had to move her queen back now and lost time. And time is super important in chess. It is part of the game. It is almost a piece in and of itself. And so her having to move her queen back and forth just gives white the positional advantage and gives her time to set up her pieces, whereas Sonia has now moved her queen multiple times and not had that same advantage. Vera then plays bishop c3 moving the bishop to attack this knight and threatening to take it because now say Sonia just plays like a normal move like mm, b6 now she can threaten to take and this is just a horrible horrible kingside structure and it would be hard to defend against this just not a great position for black and nobody wants to be defending a kingside that is that open instead of all this happening Sonia just moves her bishop back and says I'm going to defend the knight. If you want to take the knight, I'll just take back with the bishop and we'll be fine. I don't have to open my king side. Now Vera responds playing queen e2, developing her queen and potentially letting the rooks be able to come to the open files. And so Sonia says, I'm going to play b6 and I'm going to bring that bishop to b7. And I'm gonna, it's going to be a really nice bishop on this diagonal threatening this knight if this queen ever moves so that then you would have to take back and your king side would be screwed up. So... Vera is like, you know what? I'm going to play knight g5. And she is threatening to basically take this knight and then once they take back to then take this pawn. Now say Sonia plays like a waiting move and she plays like bishop b7. Now, basically, they can take on f6 and Vera would take, trade, and then take this pawn forking the two pieces and the king cannot take back because the bishop is looking over there. So then say... Sonia's like, dang, I have to get something out of this. Let me play like bishop takes b2. You can just move the rook quietly out of the way. And then you're threatening to take the bishop and the rook is also hanging. And so she would play like maybe like bishop e5 and then white would win the exchange. And this is just winning for white. And so it still is complicated play because there is this attack going on over here. Like it is still not super, super lost for black, but it's definitely a better position and you win the exchange. So obviously Sonia did not want to get into this. So instead she played G6 saying, no, thank you. I'm going to block all this from happening and we're not going to be dealing with that. So then Vera's like, sure, fine. I'll play queen f3, threatening to take this knight. If you do not defend this knight, I have two pieces attacking it and you only have one defending it. Sonia then plays bishop b7, attacking the queen, saying, hey, get the hell out of here. But Vera's actually really happy to see this because she wants to go to the h-file to then have this threat coming towards the h7 pawn. So she plays queen h3, very happy. And now the threat is basically that white is going to take this knight and then once you take back it would be mate on h7 so she cannot allow this so instead sonia plays h5 saying nope i'm going to defend all of my weaknesses and now vera plays rook ad1 this is a critical moment in the game this is the moment everything could change with one wrong move what would you play here as black it's not so easy to find a move and um, maybe Sonia could have played queen takes c4 and then rook d7 comes attacking both of these bishops. But thankfully, black would have the nice move of bishop takes g2, queen takes, and then taking the knight over here and black survives. So Sonia could have played that, but instead she played knight g4. And this is where the game turns. See if you can find what the winning move for white is. Black resigned after Vera played the intense, intense move and see if you can find it. It's actually really hard. I didn't understand why this move was played when I first saw it. I was like, why did black resign? But it's actually a really, really, really strong move. So white played rook d7. See if you can get why this is such a crazy move. So if black takes the rook, because it looks like, isn't that rook just hanging? If black takes the rook, white plays queen takes h5, sacking the queen. And if black takes back, it is mate on h7. A brutal, brutal attacking sequence. And if they do not take, it is just mate on h7. The reason that Vera had to play uh, rook d7 prior to playing queen takes h5 is because if she does not play rook d7 the queen is still going to be looking this way and if say now she plays queen takes h5 black has a beautiful saving move of queen takes h2 forcing a trade of queens and then 
really white doesn't get anything out of this. And so she had to play rook d7, deterring the queen to not be able to look at that diagonal. And it's just, it's, it's a beautiful move. I'm so like shocked by even seeing this like it's just so gorgeous and even if like say um black wants to play here um just trying to stay on this diagonal it's sorry but you're still gonna lose because now rook takes the bishop and it is just lost for black this was a beautiful attacking game by vera Menchik. if you thought that she couldn't play attacking chess this game kind of proves you wrong that she is a positional player, but she can also play attacking chess. And it was a beautiful game by her. Vera ended up winning the championship, retaining her crown by this match. It was like 11 and a half to four and a half, just a clear dominance over the board. And she retained her title. Vera was the longest reigning chess champion in history, holding her title all the way from 1927, all the way till 1944, when she tragically died. Vera sadly died in a bombing from the Nazis in 1944 over her home in London, where we actually lost a whole bunch of her games that were also in that home that she had played these women were icons in chess and they paved the way honestly and they were trailblazers for women in chess and it is super inspiring to read about their stories and where they came from and how they got to where they were and it's also really really sad that a lot of their you know prime years in chess were robbed by the war if you guys haven't read chess queens i would highly recommend it it is a fantastic book I literally read it three times last year because I was so obsessed and so incredibly inspired by all these women. I was like, yeah, I want to be them. Um, I need to do everything I can to be as strong as I possibly can as a chess player in honor of them. Just that one mistake from Black costs them the game and Sonia lost in just 21 moves. What was it? Yeah, 21 moves. And Vera took the championship title once again. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was really fun to record and I hope you're inspired by these two women just as much as I am. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. What the hell? Okay, I don't fucking know.